Jurassic Park is one of my favorite film series of all time, but it's no longer scientifically accurate. This video demonstrates how the real Tyrannosaurus Rex, rather than the dull, insensate brute depicted in the series, was an agile, intelligent, and keen predator. We'll cover the size difference between the fictional and real T-Rex, its senses, behavior, fighting ability, and preferred prey. We even analyzed how a real T-Rex would fare in a matchup against real-life versions of the Jurassic Park theropods that regularly kick its teeth in thanks to the film's inaccuracies. So, to quote one of the greatest sci-fi films of all time, Hold on to your butts. Before we get too far into the video, here's a disclaimer. This isn't some kind of hit piece against Jurassic Park. I'm a big fan of the series overall, and 1997's The Lost World is probably the best display of megatheropod behavior in a blockbuster movie. I just want to address a lot of myths and misconceptions that the films, as good as they were for the time, have used to poison the well of the public consciousness. Let's use updated science to bring the true Tyrant Lizard King to light, with the iconic Rexy as our litmus test for accuracy. I like Buck and Doe more, but Rexy has a lot more screen time, so we get more information out of her. The first category is size. The first thing we need to get straight is that Rexy's size throughout the four Jurassic movies she appears in is quite inconsistent, and it changes between films and even scenes. That's because a mixture of animatronics and CGI was used for the original trilogy, with almost entirely CGI for the Jurassic World series. Models changed sizes according to what looked best in the shot, without the concern for consistency that online nerds like you and I strive for. The best approach, then, is to go with official stated sizes from the creators. In this case, Rexy's original 1993 animatronic was 12.2 meters or 40 feet long, while her design in the later Jurassic World movies had her at 13.5 meters long and 5.2 meters tall at the head. In behind the scenes featurettes, in film references, and even toy material, her Jurassic World incarnation is stated to weigh 8.4 metric tons. Average Tyrannosaurus adults would be in the 8 to 9 ton range, so that doesn't seem off at all. Until you realize that those T Rex specimens are typically 11 to 12 meters long. If you scaled up a real T-Rex like Scotty to Rexy's length, you'd end up with a 13.7 ton behemoth. That's over 5 tons heavier than the ultra-lightweight film version. A reason for the discrepancy is that when Jurassic Park was made, high-quality laser-based volumetric reconstructions hadn't yet become the preferred mode of mass reconstruction for dinosaurs. Wrapping 8.4 tons of muscle onto a 13.5 meter rex would result in an emaciated, near-mummified creature entirely unrealistic in how skinny it is. Oh, wait. When I feel like I'm about to faint, I eat a cube of cheese. <laughs> so yes, Rexy is much longer than a real T-Rex, while also being far more lightweight in proportion to her body length. The biggest fragmentary rex specimens we know of in 2025, Cope and Goliath, each comfortably exceeded 11 metric tons, with Goliath potentially getting close to 13. Smaller but more complete individuals like Scotty and Sue still were over 10 tons, and most suspected adults exceed 8. Calculating an average adult mass is difficult given that most rex specimens don't have a well understood age. Almost any average you come up with is going to be contaminated by sub-adult specimens. You could go really wild and count adults as only specimens that have unambiguous evidence of being fully grown, which would make a typical adult well over 10 tons, but I covered that in detail in another video. You might enjoy it. On to anatomy. The animatronic that Stan Winston created for Jurassic Park was a technological marvel, but even it had its flaws. Apart from being half-starved with a thin rib cage, it had a skull that had been warped and altered from the original fossil material shape. The orbital horns above its eyes were greatly exaggerated, and its nasals, the top of its snout, curved up and made the skull seem unnaturally short and round. Rexy's angular, the rear portion of its bottom jaw, is sunken inward when it should be convex, and her maxilla is overly curved. None of the franchise's T-Rexes have lips, which is considered the most likely state as of the time of this video's writing. For those of you interested in learning more about basic theropod anatomy, I'd strongly recommend checking out Scott Hartman's SkeletalDrawing.com. He's a paleontologist and anatomist who's helped me out with a few of my videos, including size calculations for Cope, and he has an excellent anatomy reference on his website. Rexy's wrists make me want to sign her up for physical therapy. Theropod wrists are typically held in a supinated position, with the fingers facing in towards the chest, thanks to the arrangement of their metacarpals with their ulnar radius. Rexy's arms look like they've been broken at the wrist and healed wrong, pronated so they're facing down towards the ground. Yikes. Oh, he needs some milk! Now for senses. We all know how the Jurassic Park Rexes suffer from poor vision. They can't see you if you don't move. 
The in-universe excuse is that they utilized frog DNA, which I guess covers their butts a little, but it's still hokey. Tyrannosaurus Rex had massive eyes with deep front-facing sockets, giving it spectacular binocular vision. According to the American Museum of Natural History, they may have also been able to see in multiple light spectra. Studies also show that their smell was incredible, comparable to bloodhounds and vultures, meaning that it would have been able to track you from miles away even if it couldn't see you. Scans of their brain cavities indicate that Tyrannosaurus also had keen hearing, so no luck trying to escape on your tiptoes. It can see you, it can smell you, and it can hear you. A young Tyrannosaurus, with its proportions more adapted for high-speed running, would be a human's worst nightmare in a dark forest. Speaking of running, Jurassic Park actually made Rexy too fast. In the original film, she pursues a jeep moving through the forest, and was stated to run as quickly as 32 miles an hour or 51 kilometers an hour. Real-life Tyrannosaurus wasn't that much of a speedster, although it wasn't horribly behind. According to Bowai and Swan 2024, young T-Rexes would have sprinted at between 15 and 32 miles an hour, 22 to 52 kilometers an hour, with the bulkier adults ranging between 17 and 20 miles an hour, 23 to 28 kilometers an hour. That's still fast enough for the adults to catch all but the fastest Olympic athletes and they easily outpace modern animals in their size class like elephants. If it came to a race though, Rexy would win this category handily. Tyrannosaurus Rex needed to be fast linearly to take down the big hadrosaurs like Edmontosaurus, as well as the snack-sized ornithopods like Pachycephalosaurus. Their agility was crucial for battling Triceratops and Taurosaurus, which combined the weaponry of rhinos and turtles with the size of abnormally large elephants. Rexy's intelligence and stealth leave much to be desired. She roars incessantly during ambushes, goes out of her way to randomly attack smaller predators while there's an active volcano in the background, and generally pursues chaos for the sake of chaos, abandoning optimal foraging theory in favor of optimal carnage. Tyrannosaurus in real life was a stealthy predator, likely capable of laying ambushes, cooperative hunting, parental care, and perhaps simple tool use like we see in crocodiles today. I do an in-depth analysis of how reptile intelligence is severely underrated in another video, but for here it's sufficient to say that theropods would have been far more crafty in general than how Rexy is depicted. The concerned parent and almost playful behavior of Buck and Doe in The Lost World is much more realistic, to give the series credit where it's due, but even they would have been much quieter. A 2018 study found that large theropods had specialized foot shapes to disguise their direction of approach, making the powerful vibrations from their footsteps either diffused equally in the ground or concealing their movements entirely. They also wouldn't have roared for the sake of being loud. Loud noises drive prey away. They were highly tuned into low frequency sounds and may have used those to communicate with one another. Rather than the mammalian shriek of Rexy, think a cassowary's grunt crossed with a crocodile bellow. From my perspective at least, that's far more terrifying. Now what about combat? Besides Rexy scattering the raptors in the first film and randomly killing a Carnotaurus in Fallen Kingdom, she's done quite poorly in the fights shown on screen, not to mention the bull rex from Jurassic Park 3 getting its neck broken by the kaiju spino. They typically bull rush, again with a roar, and get pinned down by taller opponents while their own bites have little to no effect. The only official source on bite force I could find was from the Dinosaur Protection Group website, where the state T-Rex has a bite force of 34,000 newtons. That's definitely on the lower end of modern estimates, which put medium-sized specimens like Stan at 48,000 newtons. The biggest exemplars, like Cope or Goliath, would be closer to 70 or 80,000 newtons, more than double Rexy. Based on healed injuries from across dozens of Tyrannosaur specimens, we know that a typical strategy involves using their jaws to attack the face and neck of their opponents. Tyrannosaurs were highly territorial and antagonistic predators, based on the sheer prevalence of injuries found, and could shrug off serious punishment. T-Rexes were known to survive broken ribs, bites on the jaw, parts of their tails getting ripped off, direct bites to the back of the brain case, and even broken necks. While T-Rex couldn't shrug off being thrown like a doll into buildings or judo throw other megatheropods, the gap in durability between these prehistoric apex predators and their movie monster versions isn't as big as commonly touted. So how would the thrilling megatheropod duels have changed if accurate versions of the combatants were brought in? There's no gentle way to put this. Accurate T-Rex versus accurate Spinosaurus is a slaughter. The only remains that we can be pretty confident about referring to Spinosaurus at the moment is the Neotype, which was 11.4 meters long and weighed around 3.5 tons. The animal is low to the ground with a tall sail and heron-like neck. Its long jaws, while certainly well suited for capturing fish, aren't going to be dealing out lethal damage to a predator two to three times its size, and its arms aren't positioned for effective swiping against animals its own height or taller. But what about the giant fragmentary specimens, eh? The rostrum and dentary? We don't know if they do belong to Spinosaurus or not. Let's be generous and say they did. They'd scale, being very liberal, to 7.5 to 8.5 ton animals. 
that's still smaller than a typical T. rex adult, and they were nowhere near as optimized for combat against other megatheropods. It's like putting an office worker armed with a large stapler against a bodybuilder with a mace. Spino was brutally outmatched in every single category, leading to an easy victory for the bull rex. It would end up being the film's main antagonist. Unfortunately, that would mean we never got to see the super cool river scene from Jurassic Park 3, so we should probably leave things as they are. Jurassic World Rebirth seems to be moving somewhat in the right direction with their short-legged paddle tail spino designs, except for those hideous skulls. We'll see how things go there. How about the Indominus Rex? Well, there's no accurate version of a fictional hybrid, which makes that a little bit harder to gauge. A real T-Rex would probably be able to output more damage, but not be as tanky. A realistic Indominus would have the base genome of a T-Rex, but with more gracile jaws, weakening its bite, and its long arms and claws were better positioned for combat than those of Spinosaurus. That one's a toss-up. When I mentioned that Rexy had done poorly in all her megatheropod fights, that wasn't strictly true. She did defeat a massively oversized Tarbosaurus in the spin-off show Camp Cretaceous, although it was embarrassingly close. To be fair, a scaled-up Tarbo is basically a slightly less robust Rex, so there shouldn't be that much shame in struggling with it. In a realistic matchup, however, Rex outsizes Tarbo by 3 to 5 plus tons, making this a bit of a weight class mismatch. Finally, we have the epic, heroic, tragic battle that never was. When Colin Trevorrow, the director of Jurassic World and Jurassic World Dominion, said he was dedicated to accurate dinosaurs, I didn't think he meant take two apex predators that didn't live at the same time or on the same continent and make them fight in a flashback, but uh, I, I guess that is what he meant. He also seemed to think that bullying T-Rex with a Spino and Indominus wasn't enough because he had this mutated isosceles alligator not only dwarf Rexy, but overpower her twice in the same movie. There's a lot to unpack with the so-called Joker Giga, and how horrible its design was. With 2001 Spinosaurus, they at least had the excuse of the material being total crap. But the Giganotosaurus holotype is 70% complete. I mean, come on, son! Oh, man, it was a throwaway, so we could make an entrance. But you got a roll. I can't do this with you right now. Anyway, if this T-Rex episode gets to 100,000 views, I'll make a Giga episode and cover the whole sordid affair in detail there. So please, like the video and subscribe if you haven't already so I know if you liked it. <clears throat> Back on track. For practical purposes, a typical Tyrannosaurus adult and Giganotosaurus adult were approximately the same size. There's some uncertainty as to the life stage of the Giga holotype, with fusion of some bones being a possible indicator of adulthood, but that goes for Rex as well. Scotty, one of the biggest specimens, has as much of a case for being fully grown as the Giganotosaurus holotype does. The Gigachin, or giant dentary specimen, isn't really worth using since dentaries vary wildly in size even within the same individual, so if we take the dentary specimen being 10.6 tons at face value, which we shouldn't, we'd also need to accept Rex uber fragments like the UCMP weirdos, which Frankly, I don't want to. We'll say then that Giga is 8 to 9 plus tons, right in average Rex territory while being possibly bigger. If they're at parity, then it's all about the build. Giganotosaurus had a stiff neck and long jaws, which it could open and close quickly, great for taking bites out of the living mountains of sauropod flesh it lived with. Its arms were barely any longer than T-Rex's, and neither pair would be of any use in this fight. Its femur had a large fourth trochanter, indicating that it was possibly adapted for speed and scaling from Carcrodontosaurus, its bite force would have been around 30,000 newtons, just below the fictional Rexes. It's a formidable beast by any reasonable standard. Unfortunately, it would lose to Tyrannosaurus most of the time in a head-to-head. -head. While certainly capable of pulling out a victory perhaps 30-40% to 40 of the time, Giganotosaurus was just not as adapted for megatheropod battles as its rival. T-Rex fought its own kind on the regular, and a 2019 study indicated that it was nearly twice as agile as Giganotosaurus. Its bite is stronger, it has a better ability to avoid and deliver attacks, and better binocular vision to allow close combat maneuvers and judging distance. It has pretty much every advantage. That being said, their comparable size and Giga's cutting jaws would make it far from a stomp. Would Jurassic Park 3 or Dominion change as movies if we got accurate megatheropod fights? I mean, not that much, they would probably still stink from a writing and character perspective, but at least we'd get to see T-Rex treated properly on the big screen, which is all I can really hope for from Jurassic World Rebirth. Let me know what your hopes are for that movie in the comments, and if you're watching this video after the release, then tell us if it met your expectations. I've got my fingers crossed. I really want it to be good, but we got burned bad last time. We'll see. We'll see. But I don't want to end the video on a sour note. There's quite a bit that Jurassic Park, both the novel and the movies, got right about the T-Rex. 
I already mentioned the parental care in The Lost World and how Buck and Doe went to great lengths to protect their offspring. They saw the trailer on the cliffside as a puzzle, an enriching way to eliminate perceived threats that they didn't fully understand. In the book, Rexy was also shown to be a powerful swimmer and used the lagoon to ambush the protagonists. Most animals are, in fact, decent to good swimmers, and meg theropods wouldn't have been any different there. Tyrannosaurus doesn't seem to have specialized in a shoreline or semi-aquatic hunting lifestyle like Spinosaurids, but it would have been more than capable of keeping up with a rowboat or typical human swimmer. Another tidbit worth mentioning is that Rexy was raised on a diet of goats and was thus used to eating small prey. She specifically was less accustomed to a big game hunter lifestyle than an accurate Tyrannosaurus would have been, so that excuses some of her apparently irrational behavior. An animal that was raised its entire life in captivity, especially in a context where its economic value is tied into trained hunting behavior, isn't going to act like its wild counterpart even if they had the exact same genome. Oh, and if you're into dinosaur fights, you'll want to keep an eye out for my Paleo Fantasy series Extinction. The first book, Obsidian Dawn, should be getting a cover reveal here in the next couple of weeks, and will be available for pre-order this summer before a November 2025 release. If Aztecs riding raptors and fighting Carthaginians and Carcrodontosaurus sounds interesting to you, you've come to the right channel. Feel free to join the channel to support my work and gain early access to videos at the Mega Theropod tier and above, with the Raptor tier receiving loyalty badges and shoutouts. I'm the Vividen, and I'll see you next time.